Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, today, we are running this seminar to talk about what's in store for the NHRP in 2022. Um, I am Mickey, the Development Director at the NHRP. We also have Courtney Fern, who is the Director of Government Relations and Campaigns, and Kevin Schneider, our Executive Director. Um, and yeah, thank you again for joining us. I guess we'll hand it over to Courtney. Hi, I muted myself because my dog decided to um, start barking. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for joining us to go over our kickoff for 2022 and what we have in store this year. It's going to be a really um, exciting year for the NHRP and animal rights in general. And I'm just going to quickly go over our um, legislative uh, advocacy that we'll, we will finally be embarking on and um, our grassroots campaigns that we will, new ones and continuing ones and some exciting um, other projects that we'll be working on. So the first, I guess, big thing is for the past year and a half, uh, we've been working with uh, lawmakers in a particular jurisdiction on the first non-human animal rights legislation, and it is all teed up to be introduced hopefully uh, next month or the following month, and it will uh, establish rights for a designated species, um, the right to exercise their autonomy, to live in their natural range and habitat, and not be restrained by any person or entity. So uh, really complementing the work we're doing with our litigation. Um, and it will be the first uh, non-human animal rights legislation introduced anywhere in the United States. And so we're really excited about that. And um, we hope that you all will um, you know, support us in this journey. And um, we, of course, will update you along the way and let you know, um, you know when it's introduced and how you can get involved and um, support our work there. Um, and I apologize that I can't go into any more detail, but until it's introduced, we sort of have to keep, you know, the species and sort of where it's being introduced um, under wraps, but we're really excited that this is, you know, finally happening. Um, along with that, we're going to be continuing on with our campaigns to free Minnie and Happy. Um, we're going to have a day of action on in a couple of weeks for Happy, which will be on the day that marks the 16th year that she's been held alone at the Bronx Zoo. Um, as you all know, she's been imprisoned uh, for 45 years, might be 46 years this year, um, and 16 of which now um, she's been held alone. Um, so we'll be having a day of action for you to be able to contact Sioux officials um, and really uh, amplify her story on social media um, in any other way that you'd like to do so. So that will be coming up shortly. We're gonna have another week of action like we did last year on behalf of all of the clients that we've represented, um, including Tommy, Kiko, Hercules and Leo, um, Minnie and Happy. Um, regarding Tommy, we're gonna to have a, we, I don't know how many of you read our annual report, but we've uncovered, we, we've always been keeping tabs on Tommy and Kiko. I should just let everyone know there's not, you know, a, a week that goes by that we don't check in and, and see if we can gather more information on, you know, where they're being held and what the conditions of their captivity is like. Um, and regarding Tommy, we've spent a significant amount of time trying to locate him. Um, we've hired two private investigators and we have done significant um, FOIA requests to state agencies and um, the USDA. And we believe we've now located Tommy. Um, we're just waiting for one more uh, batch of documents from a state agency to just confirm his location. And once we have that, which we hope will be um, by the end of the month, we will be launching a new campaign for his freedom since we uh, believe he's been relocated and we know who his new captors are. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, we also have been uh, keeping tabs on Kiko, um, his captors, the Presti Presties have um, public social media. And so we always regularly check that. And we have an outstanding FOIA request with the um, New York agency um, that oversees the keeping of chimpanzees. And so we're hoping to have updated information on Kiko. Um, and with Hercules and Leo, um, many of you saw, we have been advocating for the conditions 
at Project Chimps to improve so that they have daily outdoor access. And we're gonna to continue to advocate for that um, until that happens. Um, and uh, with Mini, uh, we obviously are keeping close tabs on the Comerford Zoo. Um, we're going to support any legislation in the state of Connecticut that would at least um, end the use of elephants and traveling animal acts and also continue on with our um, pressure campaign for the Cumberfords to voluntarily send her to either PAWS or the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee. Um, so we'll be continuing on with that. Um, and then our, I guess, big new campaign will be for our California clients. Um, uh, Kevin will go into our upcoming litigation, but um, as many of you know, we plan on filing on behalf of uh, an elephant in California. I personally visited all of the places where elephants are being held captive in the state over the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, we're really happy to start advocating on behalf of those that we selected. And um, we will have a strong campaign um, to correspond with our litigation to put pressure on um, the captors to send them to a sanctuary. Um, and lastly, um, we've been working with several production companies on um, documentaries covering various aspects of Happy's story and her, um, her case. And you know, we're gonna continue working on that and hopefully they'll be really shortly. And there also is an, we believe an upcoming piece on Happy, a really detailed one in a major publication in the US, which um, we hope will come out um, in the next uh, couple of months. So that's a brief update for me and I will turn it over to Kevin. Great. Thanks, Courtney. And, um, you know, we'll have time um, towards the end to have, you know, totally open for any questions, whether it's about the uh, work that Courtney's doing uh, with, you know, uh, legislation and policy, or whether it's any of our court cases or, you know, anything else. We're happy to take any questions and thank everybody for, for joining. I see some fam familiar names here, which is always nice. Um, so I'll jump right into it because we have uh, from our legal team perspective and really the whole organization, um, I think this is our most, really by far, our most ambitious year yet in terms of what we're planning and hoping to have filed um, over the course of the next 12 months. <clears throat> so, of course, uh, top of our minds, and uh, I'm sure many of you, is Happy's case in New York, which uh, we are, for anyone who hasn't um, been following along, we're just waiting now for the highest court in the state of New York, the Court of Appeals to schedule her hearing. All the briefs have already been submitted. We're starting to get um, and have been getting lots of terrific amicus briefs, you know, friend of the court, basically outsiders to a case will, uh, you know, file documents in support or, of a case or arguing against the case. So we're getting uh, really tremendous, as, as we have been for years, uh, tremendous legal scholars and social science folks and philosophers, you know, other people with, you know, decades and decades of expertise um, in dealing with, you know, some of these really complex issues that come up in our cases, um, including Lawrence Tribe, who's uh, kind of a legendary, really uh, law professor from, from Harvard. Um, he's been supporting our cases for years and habeas corpus experts. And we're really excited to uh, soon have a amicus brief from Evan Wolfson, who's been a a friend of the NHRP for years. Uh, Evan Wolfson was the director and uh, founder of Freedom to Marry, which was the group responsible for, uh, largely responsible for ultimately securing the right to marry for everyone, including LGBT people uh, in, uh, in the Oberfeld decision in the Supreme Court. So, you know, we, we're having people that are, have tremendous influence in the legal community, um, voicing support for, for our case for happy and more broadly for the idea that, you know, rights and legal consideration uh, should not stop at the human species. So that's really exciting. And uh, we don't know, it's kind of like reading the tea leaves when it comes to, you know, when is the Court of Appeals actually gonna schedule our hearing? Uh, our best guess based on, you know, the typical case timelines is that we'll be heard in, uh, around September. So, but we're continuing to check every month. We're always asking the court, you know, are we, are we on your calendar? Or are we not? Uh, we try to be as polite as possible, of course, but um, they, you know, they're very open. It's just, you know, these things 
take time, unfortunately. Although the good thing we do, um, we do know from you know court data and their own reports, once they actually take up a case, it, it takes a while for it to get you know heard, but it's usually within a month or a month, uh, two months, one to two months that they turn around in opinion. So we're very hopeful that before the end of the year, you know, we'll get the answer on Happy's case. And, you know, of course we can't, it's so hard to predict, it's really impossible to predict what the judges will do. There's, um, since the time we filed to have Happy's case heard, I think there's been three or four new judges on the bench, um, uh, at least three. Most notably, um, some of you may know the name Judge Fahey, who's been extremely important for our cases in New York. He's a member of, or formerly, he just retired. He was a member of uh, the Court of Appeals, the highest court in New York. And he was really instrumental um, three, almost four years ago, um, issuing a, a concurring opinion in Tommy and Kiko's cases that, you know, really for the first time, we had a high American high court judge saying basically that we're right and that animals, you know, we really need to, the legal system needs to really grow up and, you know, finally reckon with the fact that, you know, we're not the only species on the planet that need and really should have legal rights. So uh, suffice to say, there's lots going on in Happy's case. It's, it's, it's surely to be like, a, we think a real spectacle. Uh, we're hoping, of course, that COVID permitting, it can be a hearing that, you know, the public can attend. The Court of Appeals has been doing that. Uh, but in any case, it's going to be recorded. They stream things, I believe, live. So um, everyone will get to see it, which is for us, you know, kind of the most important thing of this. So everyone can get an eye into the, you know, process of these courts and when they're deciding cases like Happy's. Um, so that's, like I said, we're hoping September, the Happy's case will be heard. Um, and then in the next, I want to say month or two, we are finally going to file our first case in California, which we've been working on for a really long time. Uh, I won't go into all the complexities, but one of the, um, as you might imagine, uh, kind of complex parts of it is, is selecting the right perfect kind of first client, making sure that they have a place where a sanctuary that, that, that can take them in, you know, so that we're actually asking the court to issue like real substantive relief send um, send the individual to a sanctuary. And I won't go too much into uh, the details of where we finally decided to file, but I can say that it will be on behalf of elephants. So we will be continuing uh, the work that we've done in Happy's case and certainly Happy's case, we think hopefully will really open doors in California and other states because um, this is the first time that a high court in any state, really in any part of any, in any really in our legal kind of tradition, any court has taken a case uh, like this. So we, we're hoping that that will get the California courts to see that, hey, this is something that they uh, really ought to be taking seriously. And we have some indications that California will be a little more um, hospitable to us than perhaps some other states have been, um, including the fact that it's been about four years, four or five years, we were contacted by a clerk um, on the California Supreme Court, the highest court of California. And uh, our founder, Steve, Stephen Wise, was, uh, was invited and went to go speak at the California Supreme Court about our work. So, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's clearly an interest there. We, don't, we can't know what that will mean and judges aren't gonna, you know, guarantee anything, of course, but um, we think that there's real interest there. Uh, we're filing, we're, we're planning to file a couple months after that, a very similar case in Colorado. I, I can't, again, say exactly where, but again, we're looking at uh, elephants. We think there's, we have real momentum going with Happy's case. And in some ways, certain ways, it, it simplifies our work. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to go from one state to another and, you know, have to learn the new laws and everything. Uh, so we're finding that, you know, building more and more cases around elephants helps us to at least focus on the, you know, the legal aspects and a lot of the factual aspects can, can really carry over. And we, we rely on the same experts and the, you know, the same kind of facts to make really any habeas corpus argument for pretty much any elephant. Uh, so Colorado, we're hoping uh, probably around the middle of the year. Um, we've been working on that for quite a while, but, you know, California's become the priority. 
Um, and then we're looking already into uh, the next states that will file. Some of you may be aware, uh, like, like Courtney talked about, uh, touched on uh, cases that we had in Connecticut. But unfortunately, at this time, we've really had to transition to, um, you know, a policy and legislative approach to that state because we just don't think the courts are ready. You know, hopefully someday we begin winning in California and New York and we can go back there, perhaps armed with those kinds of wins. But right now, uh, yeah, Connecticut is, is kind of off the books for us, at least uh, when it comes to court cases. Um, so we're also, some of you may be aware, um, and this has been years in, in the works, uh, planning to file or to assist other lawyers in filing the first, our first habeas corpus cases for elephants outside of the United States. Um, and we've, we've already talked about this publicly, so I'm not giving anything away when I say that um, we're, we've been working in Israel and India. And uh, we're also, you know, always talking to groups and lawyers in other countries and, you know, helping people. That's become a, a pretty active area of our work. Um, is working outside the U.S., which has been exciting and very interesting. Um, but um, they will, much like the California and Colorado cases, one of the beauties of habeas corpus for us is that it's built on the same kind of ancient common law. And so if the jurisdiction, and that includes places like Israel and India that have a common law heritage of some sort or another, um, it makes it a lot easier, still not easy, but it makes it easier for us to take the kind of arguments that we've been developing for years in New York and um, begin to use those to file cases really around the world. So that's, um, that's going to be really exciting too. We've been, like I said, working on these for, for years now. And of course, COVID uh, got in the way, but I think more fundamentally, it's just we really want to make sure we're getting these first cases right. And so we, we take, we take an awful lot of time to, um, you know, make sure that we're doing that. Uh, so another uh, interesting area that we've been working in outside of, of the country, some of you may have seen towards the end of last year, we filed an amicus brief of our own um, in the highest court of Ecuador, the constitutional court, where they're currently considering um, a habeas corpus appeal that was brought on behalf of a monkey. Um, kind of a long story. The monkey was a pet. It was illegal. And the government came in and seized her. Her name was Estrellita. She was a woolly monkey, which is a, a species native to Ecuador and, and the Andes and kind of that region generally. And um, unfortunately, she died in government custody. But the owner, before they knew this, they filed a habeas corpus petition long story short, it found its way up to the highest court in the country. And the court there, the Constitutional Court in Ecuador, decided to uh, take up this question in a very, in a broader way. Can animals have the right to habeas corpus, but also can they have what's called you know, under rights of nature? Ecuador is the only country in the world, which is a fascinating thing to um, have rights of nature in their constitution. So under the Ecuadorian constitution, nature has rights and this court, the constitutional court there has been very active recently in deciding several cases, considering cases for forests and for rivers. There's one case they recently decided in favor of a forest and shut down uh, certain oil uh, mining, um, different kinds of mining projects that were going to disrupt the forest. So that's a totally new area for us. We, we did a brief along with Harvard Law School's animal law program, the Brooks um, Institute um, program. And that was, you know, a real learning experience for us, our first filing in Spanish, which I think was, which I think will be increasingly important for us, for our work and, um, you know, for the development of the law in that area generally in that region. Courts in Latin America have been, for one reason or another, uh, a lot more sympathetic to the kinds of cases that we make, whether for animals or for the parts of the natural environment. Uh, and so we're actually expecting some kind of word from the court within the next week or two uh, in Ecuador, whether they're going to, uh, how they're going to decide the case, whether they're going to move forward, whether we might have an opportunity to actually give some kind of testimony um, to the judges, which we really hope we get the chance to do. Um, and 
I hope I'm not giving too much away here. Someone stop me if I am, but we have a really interesting case. Um, we've talked about it a little bit, but it's it's been mostly in development, um, having to do with a horse named Reckless, who was um, actually um, a decorated milit member of the US uh, Marine Corps who served during the Korean War and did all these really amazing things. Uh, she would run up and down hills and carry wounded soldiers without any anyone directing her to do so. And she would, you know, carry munitions, you know, hundreds of pounds up and down hills while she was being shot at and uh, managed to survive that and got back to the U.S. and was decorated. You know, you actually had, you know, there's photos you can find if you look this up, reckless, you know, thousands of Marines that are standing there watching a horse be decorated with, um, you know, like a medal of honor, basically. Uh, and so we are going to, I won't go too much into the details, but we're, of course, reckless. She passed away years ago, of course, but um, we, there's actually something we think we can do within the Veterans Administration to really solidify the point that she truly was a legal person because we don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to be a, a you know, decorated Marine veteran and still be a legal thing. And so we think that that's going to be a really interesting, granted, it won't be like our other cases where we're trying to vindicate a living animal's rights. We think that it will nonetheless uh, be very interesting, thought provoking, and it's a different kind of forum would be in the veterans courts, which uh, we've been we've been working for years to actually get Steve Wise to be our founder to be um, certified to practice in this court. And we're, you know, it's, it's a long story, but uh, we're not sure at all what kind of um, reception we'll get. But, you know, there's a surprising amount of uh, sympathy. And I mean, the Marines, they're the ones that actually gave her this medal to begin with, uh, made her a sergeant. She's Sergeant Reckless. So, um, and um, beyond that, beyond all the court cases, um, we're constantly working on, you know, law review articles and journals and academic writing and presentations and basically educating the legal profession uh, as much as we can. Uh, we think that's vital to what we do. And uh, also more of these amicus briefs. So um, uh, we not only, you know, encouraging and helping folks uh, do briefs on our behalf, but we are responding to amicus briefs that are starting to come in um, against us. And so actually just a week or two ago in Happy's case, the AZA, which a lot of you may be familiar with, the American, uh, no, uh, Aquariums and Zoological Association. I think I got that right. They're basically the trade body that gives a gold star to you know, certain zoos and says that they meet their standards of, uh, of care and whatnot. But in reality, uh, basically just act as a bully pulpit for you know, the zoo captivity industry to um, essentially, well, in our case, attack, attack what we're doing and, and say that um, basically zoos have the best interests of animals like happies, uh, that they are um, you know, the best places for them, that ruling in our favor, if the courts do that, that would set a bad precedent and they, that it would set back conservation efforts, all these different kinds of arguments that are, you know, not directly uh, part of our legal case, but, you know, that we understand are, are important for, um, you know, for the general public, but also for the judges, because, you know, they're, they're making a common law decision. And part of making a common law decision is trying to take into consideration all different kinds of factors. You know, what does society think? What does science say? Um, you know, how has, how have public, how has public morality evolved over the, the decades and generations? And when it comes to our issue, we think we have a lot of evidence that we are, you know, argue forces the courts um, to um, really finally address the issue in a, in a serious way. So I'm seeing all kinds of uh, chats and, and kind of comments and questions pop up. So uh, maybe I'll stop there and we can, um, you know, start looking at some of those. Yeah, I'm seeing one. I'll, I'll just jump in real quick and say I see the first one is about Patty. So we had all kinds of legal reasons. We've been burned before when we file on behalf of more than one elephant at once. So we um, we really, you know, we're we're arguing for happy 
she, at the time we filed, she was being held alone, whereas Patty was not. That was part of the consideration, but the bigger consideration is we wanted to, if we lose Happy's case, we wanna preserve the ability to file another case. And we also believe that um, if we are able to prevail and win Happy's case, that it obviously would put us in a much better, stronger position to file cases or demand other elephants in New York also um, be sent to sanctuary. And, and just to add on that, um, in our advocacy work, you know, when we do our action alerts to the zoo, um, we don't leave Patty out of it. Like obviously Happy's the focus and she's our client, but we call for them to, um, they committed to closing their elephant exhibit when they, when one of them died. And at the time they made that statement, there were three elephants. So, um, you know, we call on them to live up to their agreement and to send Patty and Happy to a sanctuary. So we are very aware of Patty. We have not forgotten about her. Um, and so just like Kevin said, we, you know, the reasons why we're litigating on behalf of Happy First, um, you know, in our advocacy work, we do also call for Happy or Patty to be free to a sanctuary as well. Um, and to sort of do what Kevin did, I saw mm -hmm. a question pop up. I'm on my phone. Um, so I just see random ones pop up. And uh, I saw someone ask if it was game over for many or something along those lines. And it certainly is not. Um, we have waged a very aggressive campaign for her freedom. Um, and we've, we've had a lot of success of like, obviously we haven't been able to achieve her freedom, but we have gotten the Connecticut um, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, after Beulah died, they went and did an investigation or an inspection of the Comerford Zoo. And it was the first time that there was like a real inspection of the zoo. Obviously they did, it didn't result in what we wanted, which would be for her to be sent to a sanctuary, but that did happen. Um, and we have been successful in getting them to shut down their Facebook pages, advertising their, their um, you know, events that they were holding on their property. Um, like I, all eyes and ears of animal advocates in Connecticut are on the Comfort Zoo and we regularly um, check to see where they'll be next. Um, we have an action alert that will be going out soon because the Comerford Zoo is going on the road again. We don't believe Minnie's gonna be with them, but we do want to continue advocating against their, you know, their, their business model, which is, um, you know, exploiting animals for profit and, um, you know, put pressure on them to send Minnie to a sanctuary. And so we continuously are advocating for her and finding new ways to put pressure on the Comerford Zoo to send her to a sanctuary. So, you know, we always, once an animal is our client, they remain our client for the rest of their lives. So um, it is not game over for many. And if anyone, Harvey. oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I was also gonna give you uh, kudos for, you know, continuing, I don't know how much detail we can go into really, but, you know, always staying on top of any legislative efforts in, in Connecticut, because we have been able to, um, you know, break through with some elected officials and get them to really, in some in one way or another take up Minnie's cause and the cause of others uh, in Connecticut so uh, and I saw some, Jill says I'm sorry about Connecticut you know it's it's really it's not a unique issue I don't mean to single out Connecticut you know it's it's this is a prevailing idea that exists throughout the world so we have to you know some people they were kind of in the unfortunate position of being one of the first courts that was asked to do it so I, I have a little bit of <laughs> sympathy i'll put it that way just a tiny <laughs> tiny bit tiny. yeah and and you know an important thing that anyone you know wherever we file um like especially in california and when we go to colorado um if you live in a state and, and when our legislation um is introduced you live in a state where um you know our clients live um and you live nearby and you see something you can be you know an advocate for them yourselves you, you can either let us know if you saw something um, or contact, you know, the relevant local officials um, and let them know. But, um, you know, really just keeping an eye and, and eye on them is, is really important and critical to our work. So I'll just, I'm just keeping, I'm looking at the comments here. I'll just kind of run them down and then basically- There's a question, them. Kevin, about um, uh, in the past, we had talked about bringing a case on behalf of orchids. I'm not sure how much you can talk about that. Yeah, I actually probably should have mentioned that, although it's not clear yet if it'll happen in 2022. So certainly we've been um, hoping to and wanting to do a case like that for 
for a very long time. The problem has been there's not, and there still isn't yet a sanctuary that could, you know, really genuinely take in anything like a genuine sanctuary for, for an orca, really even for dolphins, although there might be some things out there now. But we're working, um, fortunately there are efforts to do that. And um, most prominently is our good friend, Lori Marino, who's been working on the whale sanctuary project in uh, Canada, which is gonna finally was, um, they selected a, a location near Nova Scotia, so on the East Coast. And uh, we're not actually probably gonna wait for it to be fully done, but we have to, we have to time it basically. So we, once we file a case, we can say to the court, you know, reasonably soon there will be a sanctuary to send um, this individual or these, this group. So that's been the main sticking point, although we are right now basically assuming that there will be one available uh, and kind of operating on that. And I would, I would hope that within the next year or so that we have our first orchid case ready to go. And, um, and certainly without getting into too much detail, uh, we're hopeful that while we're also doing that, we're continuing to, like Courtney talked about, and, and she's heading up looking at any kind of legislative avenues to do that as well. So we've been a little quiet when it comes to orcas, but that doesn't, that's not because we're not, you know, actively uh, preparing to file something. Um, so we're hoping, like I said, within about a year that, uh, you know, there's a sanctuary that's at least close enough where we can actually file a case. Um, so I'm seeing here a question from Robin about the uh, Sheldrick Trust in, in Kenya. So they're, I mean, I, I love them. I, I love their videos. They're, you know, they, for anyone who doesn't know, um, they rehabilitate uh, elephants. They take in elephants. They, and I think what's most uh, kind of inspiring is they find the, uh, they're, they have the ability to rewild them in some, in some, uh, in some cases. And we, you know, it's something we are always evaluating in our own cases. Someone like Happy doesn't seem like the experts don't really say she's a, she would be like an ideal expert uh, a candidate for um, rewilding because it's been so long and she was taken from the wild uh, in Thailand as, as a baby. So she really doesn't have survival skills that an elephant would need. But, and, you know, in some cases it could be possible. We would certainly always open to that. But in some cases where an elephant hasn't been in captivity for as long, um, you know, they really, that is more of an option. And as we start to work internationally, we're hoping that um, before too long, we're actually able to send African elephants back to Africa from various countries, whether it's, uh, whether it's in India or, you know, other parts of the world where they've been sent to. Often what you see is that as diplomatic gifts. If any of you saw the case of Kavan, the elephant um, last year or two years ago, um, he, he, he likewise was a diplomatic gift. So, you know, that's something that we're probably gonna have to deal with in some of our cases that we've never had to deal with. Uh, having a country basically reject a diplomatic gift adds a whole other layer, but, you know, we're very hopeful that, you know, groups like them could, uh, into the, you know, to the question about them doing amicus briefs, that, that sort of stuff we think is going to become uh, increasingly important for us, for sure. See, I'm just going on here. So Lucy, yeah, uh, we're very much sadly, um, and you know, we think of her as kind of the Canadian happy in a lot of ways. Uh, I know there's been legal efforts on her behalf. Um, yeah, I sadly don't know of any pending, you know, really kind of realistic efforts. Although I know there's always pressure being put on them, um, but there was one small bright spot was, um, a judge in a case, a Canadian judge, I think Edmonton Appeals Court, um, wrote a wrote a really good dissent about Lucy, and actually is a is a fan of our work and follows our work. So, you know, it's not. Uh, hopefully, it's in time for Lucy, but at least in one you know small glimmer of hope, we're starting to see judges that are willing to um, put their name down and kind of endorse the fact, endorse the idea that they really ought to have rights. And there, there's amazing advocates that are advocating for Lucy's freedom. Um, 
I always see their posts and they're so compelling. And so, um, you know, hopefully they make, you know, they're successful in their efforts. And we obviously are like very supportive of, of the work they're doing. And I see a question uh, from Suzanne about Lolita. So what, you know, we've, we've long wanted to bring a case for her, but unfortunately this, we don't think that Florida law really is, is good for us at all. Um, maybe that could change, but one hopeful effort, and I mean, I, I haven't really heard updates on this, but I'm hoping that it can have an impact. I believe there's a federal case um, that was filed by the um, tribe, Native American tribe in uh, the Pacific Northwest where Lolita comes from, where she got the name Tokite, um, uh, and they are demanding to have her returned under, I'm not sure, they're basically claiming that she's a, you know, part of their culture, which, you know, she truly is. And, and they're trying to use that to, to get her out. I'm not sure if, of, of other efforts, but, you know, sadly, the main problem for us has been Florida law, because we don't, we don't really do federal cases. So uh, we have to stick to case states for now, where there's at least, you know, we think the the law is better for us, which is not, which is not all of them, uh, unfortunately. And I see a question about Sri Lanka. The, the, the case, uh, Kavan that I mentioned, the elephant, he was actually a diplomatic gift uh, from Sri Lanka to uh, Pakistan. And uh, we were, we, we played a small part in urging the judge in Pakistan not to send him back to Sri Lanka because we said, yeah, that's where he came from, but it's not a good place for him to go. And fortunately, the judge um, decided to send him to Cambodia instead. Um, so I would hope that Sri Lanka can be reformed and because they're actually native there, you know, there's not just, you know, some countries like Pakistan, they, they had elephants, but they're no longer um, native to the region. They've been kind of wiped out over the generations. So. Um, one would hope that could be that it could be helped, but it's it's a big challenge. Um, I don't know the name of the judge. I can um, I can try to find the name of the judge. Maybe we can get that sent around from from Lucy's case, but I'm not coming up with it off the top of my head. Um, there's also a question from Jill about um, our work in India. Um, and if we're working with life, uh, sorry, wildlife SOS. Yeah, so we are um, definitely, uh, we know about them and we've been uh, going back and forth with them and different groups in the country. Um, but it's not, our actually, our, our hope is that, um, that I believe they operate perhaps a sanctuary in India, but since we're representing uh, or planning to represent African elephants, of which there are two that we know of in India. Um, they really don't belong in India, right? So if it's possible to have them go to a sanctuary in, in Africa, we think that would, where they can be with other African elephants, we think that would be the ideal. Um, and so that's what we're looking at now, but we have, that's very much going to depend on all kinds of circumstances, you know, what the sanctuary aspect and the logistical aspect, which is not directly part of a legal case, can be very challenging, um, as you can maybe imagine. Um, and going back to an earlier question, um, Lady asks, have you heard that the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria is proposing slaughtering some of the Western lowland adult male gorillas into existence and then held captive in European zoos in a practice that's becoming known as zoo euthanasia, euthanasia and zoo zoos. <laughs> um, uh, what do we know about this and can we help in, in any way? So I'm sure Courtney can touch on this too, but, you know, I was just talking about the 
you know, the AZA, this is just their European kind of equivalent. Canada has one, you, you see them, there's like a global one, WAZA, I believe. So it doesn't really surprise us that they treat animals in this way, as disgusting as it is. Um, it sadly doesn't surprise us because we've seen it with elephant, we've seen it with all kinds of species. I mean, you really look into what zoos do, they trade animals around like they're Pokemon, like they'll give you one elephant for three seals and a giraffe. And, and when it comes to, um, you know, their supposed mission of conservation, well, it sure seems to, um, you know, run into the rocks when they suddenly find themselves with, quote, too many animals or whatever their issue is. And, and so, you know, this is, I think, just endemic to zoos and their whole business model. And I think hopefully by putting on a really vigorous case against one of the most prominent zoos in the U.S., like we're doing in Happy's case and that like we'll do in California, like we'll do in other places. My hope is that it, it really gives, you know, advocates in Europe and other parts of the world um, kind of the ability to, to, you know, you really use those or similar arguments um, because, you know, this kind of stuff in one way or another is, is happening all over the world. Courtney, you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I read a, or I saw an article about the issue or the plans for the gorillas, but I don't know enough about it to comment on why they're doing it. Obviously, it's horrific, but I think like what Kevin said, it sheds light on um, sort of the the um, false falsities of what the zoo says as to why they, you know, hold animals captive. They claim it's for conservation and to help survival of the species, when in reality, it's just to repopulate their captive population to be able to exploit them for money. Um, I know with the, I think it was the giraffes in Sweden or um, another European country, they um, killed them because there wasn't enough genetic diversity amongst the captive population and they had, they were overpopulated and that just, you know, if they were truly about conservation, they would have sent, um, you know, that giraffe or these gorillas to a sanctuary and stopped breeding them and stopped, um, you know, breeding, you know, same family members so that they weren't genetically diverse. Um, Cause there are no plans to send them back to the wild. You can look in the United States, they import elephants. Um, we've had two imports within the past 20 years from Swaziland. Um, rather than keeping in their natural environment, they're bringing them to the United States merely to breed them, to hold them captive and to create a new generation of captive elephants in the United States. It serves no conservation purpose to bring them here and remove them from their, their natural range and habitat um, just to hold them in you know, small acre, you know, two acre pits essentially um, for people to stare at. Um, there's just no, uh, I see someone mentioned the conservation game, which is a great film um, that just really highlights the problem with holding uh, non-native species in captivity in the United States. Nikki, I don't know if there's another. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, I'm just looking through. <laughs> Um, I believe we may have actually answered all of them, um, but please feel free to um, send in more, um, type it in the chat box if you have any final questions. I know we're almost to the hour. Um, oh, I think it was, um, so in the Lucy case, I believe it was Judd, um, Chief Justice Catherine Fraser, or Fraser, F, F R A S E R. I actually had the chance to meet her briefly at an animal law conference in Canada, which was really great. So she actually wrote a 42 page dissent um, in, in that case where the court basically threw out Lucy's, um, Lucy's appeal. So um, that's, that's her name. And, you know, she, Really, it was, I definitely recommend um, trying to find it because it was, it's quite good. Um, great, thanks for looking that up, Kevin. Yeah. Um, Robin asks, uh, the San Diego Zoo claims to prevent species destruction. Courtney, I think this is a question for you. Um, what is our view on, view on that? 
which species? <laughs> I think, you know, they, they, they've I, seen them get credit for the condor, you know, I don't know if they, they claim that they did like captive breeding of California condors and yeah, they so and I should say I'm based in in California. So um, there there were zoos like the LA Zoo. I know specifically. Um, I'm assuming probably San Diego was involved in helping um, the uh, you know uh, what is it <laughs> helping the California condor um, by doing a you know a, a captive breeding program. And so you know programs like that where you're helping. Um, native species repopulate and then sending back into the wild is a positive thing. And we definitely applaud zoos for doing programs like that because that definitely is helping that certain species, um, you know, their survival in their natural habitat and range. Um, but with respect to, um, you know, gorillas, elephants, um, the San Diego Zoo does not have chimpanzees, but they have bonobos. Um, no, that, you know, holding them captive and breeding them is not helping um, the survival of the species in the wild, um, it, you know, it's helping the survival of the species in captivity. Um, and that's not what conservation is. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, in all of our cases, you know, Happy's case, all of them, we were often asked if this is like an attack on zoos or it's treated by the zoos as an attack on them. Um, when in reality, you know, we're not, we're just talking about elephants. The other, there's many cases that they just, they need to be addressed in their own turn. Um, so we're not necessarily saying that, I mean, I personally think that the, the more, well, the better option is, is what some other countries and other places are already doing, kind of transitioning to rehabilitation centers so that, you know, kids and stuff can go there and still learn, so they can still see animals, but they're not seeing, you know, exotic animals that are, Kind of a menagerie that's been dragged in from around the world um you know for the supposed purpose of conservation but they're actually seeing like courtney said uh the rehabilitation or perhaps helping to increase the population size of uh you know native species that are um dwindling to extinction so that you know i think there's a lot of room for for zoos to do a lot better and some of them are actually starting to to do that um and so you know, we don't we don't see what we're doing as like a broadside attack on zoos, generally speaking. But I think it's telling that their leadership treats it that way. I think that says a lot about their whole business model and what they what they're afraid of, basically. Yeah, and the species we're advocating for, the science as we you know present in our cases, show that they do not, you know do well in captivity, they need to be free. And that's, you know, one of the arguments we make for why their rights need to be recognized and protected. Um, you know, like Kevin said, they try to make it really broaden out what our arguments are when they're actually quite narrow. And we're advocating, you know, like with Happy's case for, for Happy. <laughs> um. And I also did get a question earlier this week um, via email about Kiko. And if Courtney, you could talk a little bit about um, what is being done currently uh, for Kiko. Yeah, so for Kiko, <clears throat> sorry. Um, for Kiko, it's been difficult to get a good sense of what's going on with him. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Prestes do have a very public social media presence. Um, they're on Facebook and on TikTok. I don't know if they have um, a, an Instagram, um, but there haven't been any recent posts of Kiko. Um, and I also regularly check the USDA APHIS's um, inspection site. And um, while it doesn't go into great detail about the living conditions um, of the animals when the inspectors go out and and you know, inspect a property. It does typically have an inventory list and shows how many, um, the, the species that were present and how many of each species were there. And the most recent inspection reports for the Prestes property have not shown a chimpanzee being present. Um, and so I filed um, earlier this year, the first week of January, a FOIA request with the 
I forget the name of the agency, but it's the New York agency, the state agency that oversees um, the keeping of chimpanzees in captivity to get any information that they have on any like license renewals um, by the Prestes um, for, you know, holding a chimpanzee captive because they have to have a special permit for that. So we're hoping to get some details on whether Kiko has passed, whether he has been perhaps transferred to a new location within the state of New York or moved out of state. Um, so we're trying to get an update on um, where Kiko is and, and you know what circumstances. Um, the last photo they posted of Kiko, I believe was in March, 2020. It did look contemporaneous because it was like with a face mask, like at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but other than that, a lot of the photos that they have posted are sort of like reposts. Um, and that's the problem with one, just allowing people to hold animals captive. It's hard to um, you know, know that they're being taken care of, at least you know, their basic needs are being met. But like with Minnie, um, with Kiko, with Tommy, we, you know, look just searching any way we can is the only way we can really, you know, find out information about them. Um, so that's what's going on with Kiko. And once we have the responsive documents from the New York State Agency, we will make those public. And, you know, we're always, of course, looking to see if what will happen in Happy's case, you know, depending what the court decides, um, it could open up all kinds of different opportunities in New York if we decide, you know, that it makes sense to possibly, you know, do another case uh, once once all the legal baggage is cleared out, hopefully by the um, Court of Appeals. And um, I think we have one uh, time for one last question. Um, Kevin, you may have mentioned this earlier, but um, will the public be able to attend uh, Happy's case? Yes, so um, assuming that there's no backsliding kind of COVID protocols, um, they, the court is open. Um, in the past, we've seen, uh, it's hard to say because it's in Albany, it's hard to say how many people might be drawn out to, to come, but um, you know, in the past we've had pretty full courtrooms. We've never been in the Court of Appeals, so, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming it's kind of like the same size and everything. Um, so that's one option. And uh, the Court of Appeals also I believe live streams, but they definitely make available, you know, recordings of every single argument. That's a relatively new policy of theirs. So everyone will, you know, it will be totally available, uh, whether live or on video. Um, great. Maybe we can like broad simulcast it on Zoom or something. Yeah, hopefully there's a way. Um, Might be, yeah. I, I have another question uh, from Naomi. Um, she asks, do you face pushback from judges arguing that moving an animal to a sanctuary isn't a complete enough form of freedom for the right to be granted? Yeah, we've actually had a court specifically rule against us um, on that exact rationale. And that was, um, that was in Kiko's first case. Um, and just kind of long story short, again, it's, it's, um, it goes against New York law. So you have cases involving human beings where say, for example, they are in a, um, they're in a prison, but they really belong in something more like a facility that a you know, mental support kind of facility. Um, what used to maybe be called an asylum or something like that. Um, and also uh, perhaps even more significantly, Judge Fahey, uh, in his opinion, the judge from the New York Court of Appeals who had to retire at the beginning of this year because in New York, where you, the law requires at age 70 that judges require uh, retire. Um, he actually wrote specifically that that was, it was wrong for the court to say that, that it's totally, you know, an available remedy, totally under the law, you know, for someone like Happy to go from a zoo to a sanctuary. Um, and in the broader picture, um, you know, I can imagine us uh, taking on eventually a case where we're actually not, we're actually trying, uh, you know, we have a candidate who, like I was talking about before, actually could go back to the wild because maybe they haven't been in captivity for too long or, you know, they meet the characteristics that the experts, um, you know, really put forward. 
you know, in a case like that, we wouldn't be even looking for sanctuary. So I think that it's, um, it's, it, yeah, it's something that we've definitely seen, but I think it's pretty fairly easily disproven. And especially when you just compare, like you can look at drone footage of um, a zoo, like the one acre in the Bronx versus, um, you know, the hundreds, hundreds of acres in a sanctuary. Um, so I think that, you know, makes the point too. And, and again, you know, these are special cases because they never should have been stolen in an ideal world, they wouldn't have been taken from their own, you know, habitat to begin with. So we have to, the, you know, we think the law has to accommodate these special cases where, you know, much like we have for human beings who are vulnerable in one way or another, you know, they can't simply be set loose on the street. That doesn't mean that they can't still get some kind of uh, relief, even from like solitary confinement or various different things. So um, we think it's, yeah, totally, um, rebuttable kind of argument. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so I think we're just about at the end of our seminar. Thank you everyone for joining in um, and for your questions. I think we had a really great, um, great discussion there at the end. So thank you so much. Um, Kevin, Courtney, thank you for joining. Any last, last things you wanna? Okay. Um, just thank you so much for joining us and for all of your support. And please be on the lookout on our social and emails for um, our when we launch our legislation or it's introduced and um, for the upcoming campaigns and actions you can take for our clients. Uh, and I just popped my, oh, sorry, Kevin. Uh, I was just gonna say, I just popped my email in the chat. So if anyone has any follow-up questions or thinks of anything later on, please feel free to email me and um, I can answer any of your questions or forward them along to Kevin um, and Courtney. Yes, and um, you know we appreciate all your support. And if, if you're able to make any kind of donation or share with other people, spread the word. Um, we really do appreciate it. We really depend on um, our supporters to, to keep us going. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.